Poverty Point is an amazing sight. Thousands of years ago, it became the first city in North America, and for a long time, the only city of its scale north of Mesoamerica. You can easily recognize it by its large mounds and rings that still daunt visitors after centuries of wear and tear, its grandeur only matched by its antiquity. Now, ancient mounds aren't that unique in the southern and eastern United States. Mound sites dot the U.S. map, and in that respect, Poverty Point looks like a grand example of mound construction from ancient Native Americans. And yet, Poverty Point is a mystery, and so much more. Much of the site defies our expectations, and although we've come a long way in understanding it, so much continues to elude us. Is this site an anomaly? And how does it fit into the bigger picture? Okay, hopefully I've whet your appetite, so let's dig into this. But before we get into the meat and potatoes, let's get some veggies in first by examining the first conclusions drawn about Poverty Point. Poverty Point had been known since the 1800s. Our first descriptions of the site come from the diary of settler Jacob Walter, who passed through in the 1830s. He was looking for a reported lead mine that was rumored to be nearby when he stumbled upon Poverty Point. After his visit, he recorded this in his diary. On my arrival at the place of my destination, on Bayou Masson, at which place I had been informed lead ore had been found, instead of a lead mine, I found myself on the site of an old Indian town. The surface of the earth at this place, for several acres around, were strewed in great profusion with fragments of Indian crockery, and a large number of clay made by the Indians for edible purposes, indicating the fact that the inhabitants who located the town were a tribe of clay-eating Indians. The clay balls were the size of a green walnut, and had been baked in fire. Thus disappointed in the discovery of a lead mine, I mounted my horse. I rode out to look and see what the country looked like in the vicinity of this old town site. I soon discovered a mound of colossal size. The figure of the base of this substructure was a rectangle, twice as long as wide, and about a thousand long by five hundred broad and a hundred and fifty feet in altitude, with top or terrace, of twenty feet wide and five hundred feet long. This mound has an inclined plane attached to one side, with a grade, so as to enable one to ride up on it with ease. I did pass up this inclined way on my horse. This is one of the largest mounds I have ever met with. Aside from a few other visitors' notes, Poverty Point was mostly ignored. During the Antebellum period, the site would become part of the Poverty Point Plantation, which is where we actually get the name of the site from, it's not what the inhabitants would have called it. Now, serious archaeological work was not actually conducted until the early 20th century. To these early archaeologists, it was clear that Poverty Point was already something of an oddity. The tools being dug up there were archaic tools. The archaic period refers to the time period before sedentary life in agriculture in North America, so this was old. Yet lots of residential artifacts and cooking pits were discovered as well, so lots of people were clearly living there. If these artifacts predated sedentary life, what the heck were those mounds doing there, and who built them? In 1956, archaeologists James Ford and Clarence Webb published their seminal work, Poverty Point, a late archaic site in Louisiana, in which they argued that Poverty Point was a city populated by thousands of people farming maize and living in a theocracy. All had been well until Hopewell war parties arrived from the north, conquered Poverty Point, and then coerced the locals into building the mounds. You'll notice that Ford and Webb, like most of their contemporaries, were pretty married to the idea that the mounds and agriculture went hand in hand, and this would persist through the next few decades. After further research discredited the Hopewell conquest theories, Ford and Webb suggested that perhaps Olmec missionaries came north through the Gulf, bringing colossal construction and corn farming with them. But people slowly began to realize that the people of Poverty Point were not utilizing agriculture, and that like their contemporaries, they had been hunter-gatherers. By the late 20th century, it had become fashionable to suggest that Poverty Point had only been a gathering place for independent groups to exchange goods and participate in religious festivals, rather than a continually inhabited city. But the thousands of artifacts recovered from Poverty Point, many of them designed for domestic use, suggest otherwise. Only gradually could people put everything together and break with their biases and conclude that Poverty Point was unlike anything seen before. It was a residential city of hunter-gatherers. A paradox, or as I would call it, a glitch in the matrix. But in fact, Poverty Point is not a glitch. 
Rather than an anomaly, it's fitting to view it as the apogee of archaic America. With that in mind, let's pull the camera back and look at the wider picture of what was going on during the archaic, and see what was being missed by those early archaeologists that we can now appreciate in hindsight. During the archaic period, life in North America was characterized by mobile hunter-gatherer groups. During this period, no intensive agriculture or crop domestication was being practiced. But interestingly, one thing that was happening was mound construction. Contrary to what archaeologists had previously concluded, the mounds of Poverty Point were not the first in the lower Mississippi Basin. By the time they were built, mound building had already been a long and hallowed tradition in the region. The oldest known mounds date from more than 7,000 years ago, but it's not until about after 4,000 BCE that mound building really begins to take off. The most noteworthy mound sites from this period are Frenchman's Bend, Caney, Watson Break, and the LSU Campus Mounds. Yes, you heard that last one correct. Louisiana State University has some of the oldest mounds in North America sitting right on their campus. Go Tigers! What makes several of these sites fascinating is that we can see similarities in their design and layout. Even common proportions and measurements have been demonstrated between them. Watson Break gives us a good example. The site is located on an abandoned channel of the Arkansas Wichita River. The mounds at the site are arranged in a circular pattern and date to about 3400 to 3000 BCE, a full 2000 years before most of Poverty Point's construction. Unfortunately, I couldn't find any photos of the site, and it's not open to the public, so you guys are stuck with this reconstruction instead. Now you may be wondering, how could hunter-gatherers actually build these earthworks? Wouldn't you need to be living at the same place in a large community for generations to do it? Well, contrary to what you may think, and I hope I'm not spoiling the mystique of mound building, building a mound doesn't actually require as much labor as you think it does, provided that you have the time. Archaeologist John Gibson points out that a small local workforce can erect a decently sized mound. He cites an account from a missionary's interview of a Choctaw native who reported that a local 12,000 cubic meter mound had recently been built in just 35 months. Dirt moving tests have concluded that it only would have taken dozens of laborers, depending on breaks in the construction time. I will point out the caveat that the study comes from a sedentary and agricultural group millennia later, but nevertheless, I think it's safe to say that it doesn't take a gigantic labor force to build mounds, and that it could easily be accomplished by archaic Native Americans. Archaic people, as it turns out, were far more constructive than we give them credit. Now with all that out of the way, let's zoom back into Poverty Point itself and examine the site. Poverty Point is located on a ridge overlooking the Bayou Masson, which prevents the area from getting flooded. The surrounding bayou is a naturally rich environment full of edible plants, roots, nuts, fish, and other animals. Thus, everyone had a high and dry place for shelter, but easy access to the bayou and food. All in all, it was an excellent place to settle down. It had everything a community would need. Now, chronology at Poverty Point is not 100% certain, but the general consensus is that the entire site was constructed and occupied from about 1730 BCE to about 1000 BCE. Most of the construction would have occurred between 1600 BCE and 1300 BCE. What suddenly triggered this massive building program remains a mystery. So what exactly did they build? The site is characterized by a series of six earthen rings that enclose a raised plaza. Outside the rings are several mounds. Let's start at the center and work our way out. The plaza is a large artificial platform. To create it, the people of Poverty Point had to fill in several channels and then level out the surface. This is a large area, and doing this must have been a huge undertaking. You could fit the entire Churchill Downs racetrack in there. The plaza was likely the site of ceremonies, rituals, and games. During excavation, several large post holes were discovered at the site. These held huge wooden posts arranged in a circle. If you go to the site, you'll see them marked out by barrels. Archaeologists are unsure what this was used for. It could have been a structure, or it could have been a wood henge, like those that appear at much later sites, such as the Mississippian capital of Cahokia. Later wood henges had astronomical functions, but that doesn't seem to have been the case here. The plaza also has two mounds, Mounds C and D. 
Mound C, also called the Dunbar Mound in a lot of the literature, was about 6 feet high and had about 8,000 cubic yards of earth. Excavations of the mound have revealed post holes which indicate that there was a structure on top, but what this building was or what it was used for is unknown. The fact that it's within the plaza suggests that it was very important. Mound D sits right at the edge of one of the rings. It's about 4 feet tall. It's also called Sarah's Mound because the wife of the plantation owner, Sarah Geyer, and two others were buried there during the site's plantation days. Speaking of which, an important thing to remember is that the mounds were not used for burials. This will be the case with later mounds in the Americas, but at this time they did not serve a mortuary function. The location of Mound D has sparked considerable debate about whether this is actually a mound or rather a very well-preserved section of the ring. Excavations of the mound have revealed that most of the mound was constructed by later inhabitants over 2,000 years after Poverty Point was abandoned. However, excavations at the bottom layers of the mound recovered many Poverty Point artifacts and even an old fire pit, so it's likely that at one point Mound C was indeed a part of the innermost ring. Beyond the plaza are six parallel ridges that ring the plaza. The rings have been reduced over the centuries by erosion and farming, and there's actually very little of them left, but in the days of old, they would have risen as high as 10 feet. The rings are cut by five roadways that emanate out from the plaza. Excavations revealed some post holes and a few housing remains and some cooking pits. Sadly, plowing, erosion, and burrowing have destroyed a lot of the domestic evidence, but the consensus is that the rings were topped by houses, in all, the rings could have held over 600 houses, which would have been home to hundreds, perhaps even thousands of people. Different rings went up as the population grew during Poverty Point's history. Excavations show that when they were erected, they were done rapidly. There are no signs of prolonged exposure in any of the soil layers. When a new ring was demanded, it went up quickly in a calculated and coordinated fashion. Now let's check out the mounds beyond the rings. In total, there are five mounds. The largest of the mounds is Mound A. It's connected to the plaza by a roadway. Mound A is enormous and needed over 230,000 cubic yards of earth to construct it. If you were going to build that today, you would need 17,000 dump trucks worth of earth to do it. The mound is actually a conical pyramid with a ramp leading to a long platform extending on the eastern side. The top of the mound is over six stories high. It's often said that the mound was built to resemble a bird in flight, but this interpretation originally goes back to the old Hopewell invasion theory, so its merits are debatable, but it's often referred to as the bird mound or the eagle mound in literature. Now, a mound this big is something you would expect to have been built over a long period of time, maybe even generations, but the truth is actually much more weird. Excavations in the platform section show that that section was built very rapidly. Some even suggest that this was done in as little as 90 days. The people of Poverty Point didn't mess around when they put forth their effort. The next mound is Mound B, just to the north of Mound A. Mound B is possibly the earliest of the mounds at the site. It's a small conical mound about 21 feet tall and 180 feet in diameter. Mound E is another early mound at the site. It's a rectangular mound 13 feet tall and 300 feet wide. There's a causeway that runs from the mound to the plaza, but whether this feature was constructed or came about naturally is debated. The function of both mounds is uncertain, but what is certain is that they were carefully planned. Mounds A, B, and E are built along a perfect north-south axis, which shows that the people of Poverty Point were expert surveyors and astronomers. Actually, those three mounds aren't even the only mounds in that axis. To the south, over a mile away from Mound E, is another mound, the Lower Jackson Mound. This mound is really fascinating because it was built 1,500 years before any of the other constructions at Poverty Point. It's actually contemporary with those earlier archaic mounds we discussed earlier. There's a lot of speculation that this may have been the anchor point of the site and that Poverty Point builders were honoring the memory of times and people long past when they built the site. The last two mounds of Poverty Point are Motley's Mound to the north and Mound F. Mound F is the smallest of all the mounds, and it was only recently discovered. Motley Mound is another large mound to the north of the site. It's over five stories high and contains over 130,000 cubic yards of earth. 
Its oval shape and dimensions have led some to speculate that its design was meant to mirror the design of Mount A and was never finished. What we can say with much more confidence about Motley Mound is that it has its own alignment. The mound is perpendicular to the axis created by mounds A, B, and E, and it also creates another north-south axis with mound C that runs almost perfectly parallel. The striking layout at Poverty Point invites a lot of interpretation and speculation. I've read that Poverty Point's earthworks were arranged to recreate the cosmos, and that they were a map of the greater area, and that they were designed in that way to ward off evil. We aren't going to get into all the merits of these. This is already a long video, and this is going real deep into the weeds. If you're interested in reading up on those, check my bibliography in the video description, and you can sate your curiosity. What's important is that the design and scale are unlike anything else in North America that we've discovered. At its height, Poverty Point would have been home to thousands of people embracing a new way of life. So what was life at Poverty Point like? How did such a large population sustain itself? Unfortunately, organic matter does not preserve well in wetlands, so we don't have as complete a picture of what was on the menu at Poverty Point as we'd like. But it is possible to look at other nearby sites and piece together a picture of what the diet was. As I mentioned earlier, the magnitude of the earthworks at the site suggested that maize had been the engine of this flourishing city, as it had been for many other American civilizations. But when no maize remains were found, that forced a tough reconsideration. Among the plants that have been identified are persimmons, gourds, little barley, goosefoot, maygrass, and sunflower. Roasted nuts and mast show that food was not just being collected in the summer, which is an important indication that habitation was year-round, and not seasonal, at least for some of the inhabitants. What's also very telling about these plant remains is that none of them are domestic varieties, which means that only wild food was being eaten at the site. That's pretty mind-blowing when you think about it. A huge community thrived for centuries on nothing but what nature provided them. But the people of Poverty Point weren't just vegetarians. They ate just about anything that moved, swam, or flew, including deer, turkeys, waterfowl, turtles, and small game like rabbits, raccoons, and squirrels. But the big food item was fish. The lower Mississippi wetlands are a cornucopia of aquatic food, and fish were a very valuable and easily tapped resource. In fact, almost no other place in North America has as much fish density as these floodplains and swamps. So high was this density that the 500 square miles around Poverty Point held anywhere from 30,000 to over a million pounds of fish. Not only are fish delicious and healthy, fishing is an activity that can be done year-round. It's not a seasonal food source. One of the ways that we know fish were widely exploited is that there's a lot of fishing plummets that have been found at the site. These skillfully carved stones were made from stone rich in iron ore and were used to anchor nets to rivers and lake bottoms. They were the perfect tools for the perfect place. Such nets and traps could have been easily used in a variety of conditions and kept fish fresh in the ovens. Wait, why did I just say ovens and not table? Well, because another set of important artifacts to come out of Poverty Point, actually the most abundant artifacts, are small earthen cooking balls made out of local loess. These are called Poverty Point Objects. These are unique to Poverty Point and the surrounding area, and likely the same clay items reported by Jacob Walter in our intro. They come in many different shapes and sizes, and are decorated with grooves and impressions. Now you might be wondering what a cooking ball is and how it's used. The people of Poverty Point cooked their food in earth ovens dug into the ground, several of which have been excavated at the site. By filling these pits with balls, they could retain the fire's heat and continue to slow cook the food like a crock pot. Not a bad way to eat at all. Food was prepared using pottery in stone bowls. Pottery isn't very abundant at Poverty Point, but some has been found made from local clay and earth. Far more common are soapstone bowls. These were far more durable than pottery for cooking since they could withstand the thermal shock much better. What makes these soapstone bowls so interesting is that soapstone is not local to the area. These soapstone bowls came all the way from Georgia, and they are found in gigantic quantities that dwarf the amount of local pottery. And while we're on the subject of non-local stone, I need to confess something. Remember earlier when I said that Poverty Point had everything its residents needed? 
Well, that's actually not true. There was one vital resource that the site of Poverty Point completely lacked. Stone. In fact, there is no local stone in the area whatsoever. What? How do hunter-gatherers dependent on stone tools live in a place without any stone? Well, they just imported huge amounts of it. All the stone tools at Poverty Point, and there are a lot of them, are made from non-local material. The closest source of stone is 150 miles away, but plenty of other materials came from places such as Arkansas, Indiana, Illinois, and Georgia. Stones such as chert, gray flint, copper, and quartzite intended for tools would have arrived in raw or very basically fashioned forms so that they could be turned into points, scrapers, drills, hoes, plummets, and other objects. The array of different tools is dazzling. You could almost say that Poverty Point was a tech hub for all the different tools that were produced from various materials. From what we can tell, these goods weren't hoarded by an elite but were made available to everyone that needed them. The nature of this long-distance trade is not fully understood. Did foreigners come to Poverty Point to peddle their wares? Were these actually sought out by Poverty Point citizens on their own accord? Or were they just passed from one neighboring group to another until they reached Poverty Point and stopped? No one is certain, nor are archaeologists certain of what was being given in return. No Poverty Point artifacts are found in these far-off areas, Food is a possibility, but fresh food would have likely spoiled on a return trip, so who knows? With such a large population and access to food and raw material, Poverty Point's culture flourished. Decorative personal objects like beads and tubes have been found at the site. Also present are clay figurines. Most appear to be androgynous, although there are some pregnant female figures, which may mean that they have something to do with fertility. None of these are especially numerous, but they do show that art was being created and that people were adorning themselves. One of the most striking artifacts are red jasper owls that have been found not just at Poverty Point, but elsewhere throughout the South in small numbers. The purpose of these owls is a mystery, but they probably represent religious or spiritual objects. Unfortunately, no burials survive at Poverty Point. This could be due to the poor preservation conditions at the site that I mentioned earlier, but it could also be an indication that the people there did not bury their dead, but may have cremated them. Burials are usually a key source of information, and having none at Poverty Point limits what we can glean about their society and culture. Now, Poverty Point's culture was not just confined to the city limits, but stretched beyond it. Poverty Point's immediate community stretched 50 miles north and south and several miles east and west. Beyond that heartland were other contemporary communities. These are identifiable by the presence of PPOs, similar stone points, and tools and art. Some of these sites even have mounds and earthworks of their own, although none rise to the heights and complexity of poverty points. Good examples of these contemporaries are up the river at the Bon Edi Bartholomew sites and the Jaketown site in the Yazoo Swamp. Similar tools and objects can even be found as far away as the Gulf of Mexico, most notably at the Claiborne site. Oddly, though, the degree of influence and similarities is very uneven throughout the lower Mississippi. Claiborne is a bit of an exception, and some nearby sites such as Catahoula have very little in common with Poverty Point, despite being right along their trade routes. It appears that some peoples opted into relationships with Poverty Point, while others remained distant and detached. Despite these contemporaries, Poverty Point was a place unlike any other at the time. In many ways, it was a city of contradictions. At first glance, it seems like just an impressive complex of Indian mounds. And yet the first people to dig into the soil were left scratching their heads. A city without farming? Massive monuments that were erected quickly? Sedentary hunter-gatherers? All of these seem unbelievable, and that's what makes Poverty Point so special. After the site was abandoned after centuries of occupation around 1000 BCE, North America never saw its like again for over a thousand years. I'll repeat what I said earlier. Poverty Point looks like an anomaly, but we should see it for what it is, an apogee. If you live in Louisiana or Mississippi or happen to be passing through, I encourage you to stop by and visit the site and show your appreciation for ancient sites in North America. Like a lot of other ancient sites in the United States, it deserves far more attention than it gets, even though it's a national monument and a UNESCO World Heritage Site. 
So get out there and show Poverty Point some love. And on that note, I bid you farewell. Take care until next time, and don't forget to like and subscribe for more ancient American content. See you later.